Dear attendees, we are very pleased and delighted to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Bushra Bukta, Principal Machine Learning and AI Scientist at Microsoft Azure Research, where Dr. Bushra leads several programs in the area of large-scale automated intelligent machine learning and AI system solutions focused in the areas of prognostics and health management. She also works on AI research for data generation and augmentation using GANs. Dr. Bushra was a senior machine learning and AI scientist and program manager at Amazon Robotics Research, where she led programs in the area of automated intelligent systems based on computer vision and machine learning solutions to automatically identify and localize packages. Dr. Bushra received several fellowships and awards, including BEA and YCWA Reach Awards for Outstanding Achievements, Amazon and General Electric's Inclusiveness Award for Outstanding Leadership and Research. And last but not least, Dr. Bushra is passionate about attracting, promoting, and retaining women in computing. She is part of the leadership community of Grace Hopper Conference for Women in Computing, Amazon Women Engineers, Amazon Women in Science, and Arab Women in Computing. In her talk, Dr. Bushra Bokta will present how we can unleash the power of deep learning for robotics trends and challenges. And without further ado, please, the floor is yours, Dr. Bushra. Thank you very much, uh, Iman, and thank you for the committee uh, for Morocco AI for inviting me and um, to this conference and such an honor for me to speak and share some of my experience and thoughts uh, in AI and how it can be uh, used uh, in Morocco. Today, what I was uh, thinking, so I did uh, work uh, um, as well in the GE General Electric uh, uh, research and also renewable energy energy. Uh, so uh, uh, my, at first, I was uh, planning to give a talk about robotics, uh, but then uh, again, applying it to Morocco will be also interesting to see some of the work that I have done and some of the work going on in uh, renewable energy in wind, uh, particularly. All right. So, uh, so that's, I'm going to be first talking uh, about uh, industrial applications of AI and machine learning in robotics. And then I'm going to switch to uh, wind operations and maintenance. So first, uh, uh, it's it's very, very interesting and enticing to think about robotics uh, and their applications. And there are a lot of actually uh, really interesting applications. And actually, even in Morocco, I think it could be expanded for robotics. So as an example, there are a lot of applications of robotics in healthcare, in, um, uh, in search and rescue, uh, robots in Mars and so on, but also like in everyday operations, like really managing packages in a warehouse where warehouses are like, uh, like several, like six feet, feet six football fields or six soccer fields uh, uh, for that, that that matter. And by the way, just right after the World Cup and, and congratulations to our Atlas Lions for wonderful and great achievement. Um, so yeah, so here, 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 for example, I'll give you a couple of uh, robots that are used, uh, that are using uh, Amazon and also in other companies' warehouses to manipulates packages and manipulates even items. So the one we see on the uh, here on the right, uh, these are called drives. Uh, basically they carry packages or they carry totes or they carry uh, these bins. Also they carry pods. Uh, pods, they have uh, items in there. Uh, uh, this uh, bins or tots also they have uh, um, items or products in them. But also these uh, these uh, drives they can carry packages, a whole package uh, for the warehouse to help humans actually uh, deliver the packages in a very short period of time. But before I start, I wanted to show you here just so that you get an an, an idea of how big these warehouses are for manipulating all these packages that go through Amazon's warehouses. 
to deliver as soon as someone presses, oh, I want to order, let's say, um, you know, a cup or I want to order pens or whatever, like, um, and uh, they have to go through this massive uh, network of warehouses that are called fulfillment uh, centers, and it's a fulfillment network, fulfillment centers and distribution centers, and then the last mile, which is actually the delivery to the customer, the end customer. So let's say, for example, I am, I, I live in um, I live in Boston, uh, and then I order uh, let's say coffee maker, uh, uh, and that one that coffee maker happens to be in a warehouse in Seattle, right? So it's all the way across the country in the U.S. Uh, and in order for that for that to make it to me within two days, right? So there is this prime delivery for two days. There is a whole big system that starts really moving, right? So uh, that the item is identified. Uh, it is uh, starts uh, kind of like the process starts being picked from the the bin or where the area is, and then put in a package and then delivered to me. So the delivery in this case, because I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about, there are a lot of applications even for robotics uh, in the fulfillment center. So I'm gonna narrow it down to actually the distribution center, which is kind of like the hub where a lot of items or, or packages come from all these different fulfillment centers. And then they, they have these hubs along the mid of the US to distribute them again. Think of it as like narrowing down, and then again distribute. So in this case, uh, the one that you see here in the back, this is a distribution uh, center in Denver, uh, Colorado, where that package will go uh, among other ones all the way from the, the, the West Coast to be redistributed to the East Coast, uh, and kind of like reshuffled and then redistributed again. And behind me, I'm not going to be talking about those small drives, those robots, but I'm gonna be talking more about a uh, robotic arm, which is here you see behind me. And just for the fun of it, I just took, this is an image, a picture I have uh, in the distribution center uh, with the robotic arm behind me. And with deep learning transformation, I can uh, take the same image. And then I have now the background is a restaurant and I am cartoonized, right? So that's, that's, that's the power of AI and deep learning. Okay, so uh, without further ado, let me just show you, actually, this is a very cool, um, and they say an image is worth a thousand words. So here is a, the explanation of the process here, right? So usually there is a person has to pick uh, packages as they come through this huge conveyor belts. And then they need each one of these uh, um, of these uh, packages uh, needs to be dr driven or put pushed by these um, uh, drives, these other robots, to this shoot so that they then get, this is basically sorting, right? So then it gets to a specific uh, area where these shoots, they are actually linked to, uh, to vehicles, to other um, vehicles uh, that then take them to the final destination, right? So, but here as humans, we are very, we are very um, good at doing sorting with our visual system and our brains. They work very, the human brain is wonderful. So here there are three tasks for the robot to, uh, the robot, this one, the, the, um, the robotic arm to achieve. A, identify, it's called singulation, identify which one of these packages has the best clearance so that it can be picked up. Uh, and then it needs to be identified, meaning there is a barcode on the package. It could be on the top, on the bottom, on the side that needs to be read so that the drive, when it comes, it knows to which shoot it takes it to. And then it needs to be inducted, meaning it needs to be put specifically on, on, a, on, a, uh, on a, a drive. And then there is also... Um, and then there was a goal when I was part of this project as a research project. Actually, this was research to product. And this one, it's actually having 500 package per hour uh, to make it to be able to be to be deployed in a um, uh, in a, a distribution center. Uh, at the time, uh, we there it was the, the the PPH or the package per hour was 400. Uh, there was one second latency, 
So, um, and also the barcode scan rate was 97%. And also there was another problem. So when you see these packages, they look good. However, a lot of some of these packages because of the conveyor belts or just the process of going through, uh, they could be damaged. And when humans manipulate these packages, they you can identify if there is a damage and they sideline it. They don't put it on the drive. So the, the damage was manual. We needed to increase the barcode scanning rate. Also, we needed to increase the pick rate. And also, uh, we needed to make the solution not too expensive so that it can be deployed. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so here uh, there there is another another problem uh, as well uh, that I'm gonna talk about. So when you're dealing with a lot of this type of data, uh, this data is also customer sensitive information because the packages they have barcodes, but the barcodes and around the barcodes there is the name of the customer, the address of the customer. We need to really make sure that 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 data does not live in the cloud, does not leave the premise. And also because we have uh, human annotators, we don't want to expose those to them uh, as well. So we there, there is a process that's called reduction to make sure that we reduct, meaning we, um, um, we camouflage a little bit or cover any information that is sensitive, that is customer sensitive before we send those images for annotation and also for us to train the models with. Um, now, that's beautiful. However, there's another problem, which is, uh, it's, I call it the ho horse before the carriage problem, which is a data dilemma. This these AI systems did great, but also they need uh, data. They need data, but before, because of the data, so you need to have data acquisition that takes time and also takes a lot of effort. Uh, and also the, the annotation needs to be manual uh, right now, uh, right? So it's, um, it's kind of like a tedious process. And also uh, before we can co collect a lot of data in the wild, we need to actually reach a certain accuracy, a certain false positive rate, certain false negative rate before uh, people can really uh, trust us to put these uh, robotic arms in our systems to start even collecting the data, right? So it's kind of like, well, I need data, but in order for me to, to get the data, I need to show that the algorithm actually can reach a specific accuracy, right? Uh, so there, there are a few things I'm gonna be talking about, which is data generation and augmentation using synthetic data, using machine learning actually to generate that, and also reduction on, um, on, that, on that synthetic data. And also we have um, annotation at scale using uh, a system with humans in the loop as well. So here is uh, the problem, as I, as I mentioned, so localization, which is um, first identifying which one of these packages, obviously like this one would be pick, needs to be picked first because we cannot go pick this one. It's abstracted by this one, plus it's flat. Uh, and there are a lot of other information that needs to be sent to the arm. It has the suction cups. It needs to know what's the surface. It needs to know uh, how much pressure it needs to put. For example, if it is an envelope versus a box, uh, it will put uh, uh, a different pressure, uh, et cetera, right? And then uh, also, uh, once it is singulated, we also need to classify whether there is a damage and what type of damage here, but also what if it is on the conveyor, on once off the conveyor belt and onto a drive, if there is a, um, a damage, because if there is a damage, we don't want to send that drive off to the chute and then, uh, you know, we have a problem or even into the floor with other, uh, with other, uh, um, uh, with other, uh, uh, with other uh, uh, drives as well. Okay, so I'll talk about the damage quickly here. So there are different types of damages. As humans, we are very, very good uh, in doing in identifying these things, but damages, they're not, not two damages are equal. And I'll, I'll, I'll highlight this because this is also very relatable to, um, to the next topic, which is in wind uh, operations and maintenance, no two failures are the same, right? Uh, but for, for this one, if we, if, we, if we focus on this one for a second, so there are different types of damages. There, are, there is a damage um, like crashed box, uh, puncture box, um, um, there is uh, cuts and holes, label damage, 
open uh, bo box damage, et cetera, right? And also there are different types of packages. There is a box, there's a Jiffy poly mailer, smart pack, SIOC, et cetera. Now, uh, not all damages are equal, but also not all damages are that severe. So we need to really make sure that, for example, if, if there is a, a, a hole in the box or a cut, uh, depending on the size of it, it's not that that problematic and it can keep going through, right? But if it's if these are these are big ones, right? So these ones uh, they they cannot go through. We need to sideline those packages, and which means we need to identify this with higher accuracy. Meaning the false positive rate and false positive negative rate needs to be very good. Uh, also, liquid damage is a very, it's actually the one of the, the highest problematic ones because if there is a liquid in the pro uh, damage, uh, and if that package is picked up, then there is a problem uh, in the floor and also with the robotic arm, the whole um, conveyor belt can stop. So it's actually, it's really, really pro problematic. Okay, so I'll, I'll uh, go through this quickly. So there are different things of the way to think about um, uh, going through the damage detection. So there are different the different uh, parts of identifying the damage, whether to pick or not to pick uh, the package by the robot. So there is one on the conveyor and one on the drive. So this means the drive, the robot drive, whether it, it needs to go uh, to the chute or then get sidelined. Um, so here, when we get a package on the conveyor belt, uh, it, it, the system needs to understand, or here the algorithm needs to identify, classify whether it was damaged or not. If it is not damaged, if it is damaged, then then log the damage and then send package to manual exception, meaning a person will look at it, right? So that's the exception path. If it is not, then we say, okay, so it is recommended to be picked. However, let's um, uh, let's still do a another uh, level of uh, of due diligence. W was there any uh, package uh, spillage, for example? Like, okay, th there's no uh, damage, but is is the is the package in the right area and so on? Um, uh, was the damaged uh, package placed on drive or not? In this case, it is not uh, uh, placed on the drive because there's, there's another piece. Like, did we pick, still pick the, 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 the package and did we pick, uh, place it on the drive? And then we realize it is damaged, right? So that's another uh, possibility. So here we might have a, a possibility that with the cameras from the top and the side, we don't see the damage. Maybe the damage was hidden by the, ha the, the arm. And once we put it on the drive and we release the, the, the arm, then we see that actually there is a damage or maybe it was a damage conflicted by the, the arm, the robotic arm. So that's why there is another process here. We, we check again whether it was uh, damaged or not damaged. If it is damaged then the drive goes through an exception path, it doesn't go to the chute. If it was damaged, then uh, if it if it says it's not damaged, we still have to look again uh, 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 whether it was uh, still. Uh, what is the percentage of of it being? Um, uh, so the reason why we have this uh, additional piece here is that if there is a confidence level, if each one of these algorithms have a confidence level of how much they are confident in their prediction of damage or not damage classification and the type of damage. If the confidence is low, we we have, a, we call what is called human in the loop. We have them verify that. So there are some humans, they take a look at that and then they say, well, actually, yes, there is a damage or no, it's not damaged, right? Uh, but if the confidence level is very high, and we still side, side, send it to the side, because if the confidence level is low, we want to send it to the side. If the confidence level is high, then we say, okay, the package is healthy, and, 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 and off goes the, the drive. Okay, so, however, there is a problem here. We want to make sure that uh, we, we could have a system that um, uh, gives us a prediction that a lot of packages are damaged. Uh, and But then that's a problem because that means our PPH, remember our uh, package per hour rate will drop. Because if that means like we're not picking up a lot of uh, good packages because we identify them that they are bad packages, they're damaged and there they go. Uh, also, we wanna make sure that we identify the packages if they are, they are uh, especially with higher severity damage, damage 
we are willing to allow for a little bit more false negative uh, rate as long as we pick those ones, we identify those ones correctly. Okay, so so there's that's a balancing act basically. That's why I said oh, not all damages are equal, not all damages are the same. So there is um, there is also balancing act here. Now. That's good. I described the problem, the solution, et cetera. But then how do we train these algorithms? We need a lot of data. As I mentioned, there is a lot of, it's what I call the carriage before the horse. We need good data, label data, uh, but uh, we don't have enough. And also uh, we need a lot of manual annotation for that as well. Uh, so it doesn't scale. So, so here for this uh, system, what we did, we had uh, actually, we did a lot of data acquisition in a couple of sites. Uh, but also we did uh, collect data in the lab uh, and we tried to mimic as much as possible in the wild, you know, how the, how the data would look like in the wild. Like here we have a conveyor belt and we tried to put like the packages with different types of damages and different types of packages and take different images and mimic some of the lighting conditions. And then we did an augmentation using gen synthetic data generation. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then here, really, what we did is that now we have um, a, any, any images we collect that are real images, they need to be redacted, meaning the labels, they need to be blurred so that we cannot recognize the, uh, the, the, image, the customer's uh, um, information right before it gets to be sent to be trained for training for damage uh, 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 for training for annotation actually Tron are these are human annotators so before we send them to human annotators we need to redact them and then once we have that that's beautiful we have all this data now it's annotated data and this is what we use for training and testing etc right okay. So uh, now let me just talk about uh, the annotation. Um, actually, this is an interesting one. The reason why I wanted to show it to you is that one of these images is uh, actually, uh, se several of these images are real images and one of them is actually a synthetic image and the human annotators, they did not realize the difference at all. So actually all of these are real images and this one is actually a synthetic image generated by a machine learning algorithm by GAN and a few other algorithms. And they and we put uh, here in this case a uh, label damage. And they were able to identify the damage where it is, but not really pay attention that this uh, this is not a real image, um, not collected actually. Um, okay, so let me go into the fun part, which is really how. Uh, we did this uh, data generation. So there is a, 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 an algorithm, there's actually a, a system called Blender. It's an open source rendering tool that allows you to create these meshes and put textures on them. So we created packages and different types of texture on them. And then uh, again, here where, uh, you know, being a scientist, it's also very important to work with other scientists and engineers and really understanding the flow of how these, um, the physics based flow of how, how these packages, when they go from a conveyor belt to a conveyor belt, when they fall, uh, this is called the rigid body, basically. So this is, a, this is an example of a rigid body simulation. Uh, this was done by uh, some engineers that understand really the rigid body, uh, how, how when they fall, how things uh, flow, right? And we want to mimic that. So this, this is an example here. Okay, so that's great. So here, um, so there were two things that we needed to generate. So the, the boxes and also the labels. And also uh, the labels in some cases, you see that some labels are, um, they need to be like hidden. Uh, we also needed to identify the labels. If, the, if this is a label, where is a label so that we can redact it? This is not a label, this is a label, this is a label. This is part of a label. And we wanted to identify all of those, right? So we want to generate it, but also to help identification for reduction and also identification for the damage detection and also for the synthetic data generation. So th there's one, uh, one interesting thing that we did is uh, using cycle again. So here, as I mentioned, like we used Blender to, to create these images. We can create these images actually even using some GANs. Uh, but we use Blender also to do that to, uh, rigid body simulation and so on and do some of the lightings. 
Uh, but the, the, the images taken by an actual uh, camera in, a, in an ambient light and the ones generated, they're quite a bit different uh, because of the light exposure and sharpness. Like they're, the images we generate are much sharper than what we would get in the real world. And we want to make sure that we train the algorithm with as close possible to the algorithm, to the images we are, they are uh, collected in the wild. So in this case, uh, we use something called, well, it's not exactly cycle uh, again, but something close to cycle again in the sense of uh, basically you do an image to image translation. Uh, like for example, you have a, a photo to a Monet, Monet to a photo, zebra to horses. So these are very well known, uh, uh, again, algorithms for translation between two styles. And basically uh, we use that. So here is an example, let me just move to this. So this is a synthetic data uh, image. This is synthetically generated. Uh, and then uh, this one is augmented. Um, so this is a real image. So we took a real image. And then this is how we augmented the synthetic data to look to see here that this is much sharper versus this is a little bit closer in terms of the color uh, scheme and also the lighting and so on. So we transferred actually the style of the real image into the synthetic image so that we can have uh, a little bit more realistic images. And as I said, one of them was this one that we gave to the uh, to the uh, human annotators and they did not realize that this was actually synthetically generated. Uh, and here, this is an example of where the damage will be identified by um, the uh, we, we put synthetic uh, damage on top of the texture here. All right, so I will stop on, on this one here. There's a lot more that we can talk about, but just to give a flavor on that, and I'm going to switch to wind uh, uh, energy because that's another application for AI that is very powerful where actually could be very useful for Morocco as well. So wind, uh, wind technology has been going on for uh, over a century, uh, but really, really recently it has been uh, get, getting, gaining a lot more momentum because of all the, 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 the effects we see from um, climate change and the push for renewable energy. And uh, wind turbines are among really, I mean, wind is a sustainable source of energy and wind turbines are a way of to harness uh, that, uh, that source of energy. Now, uh, there are different types of wind turbines. Uh, each one, <clears throat> when you see like, for example, here, the 1.2 megawatt, this is how much a megawatt uh, this turbine height with this uh, type of uh, blades and uh, the, the, the gearbox inside to generate the electricity, it can generate 1.2 megawatts. They can go all the way to 13 point, to 15 megawatts. There are some uh, really good uh, research going on to push it and we're not too far from that. So here you can see like how big they, they get to the Eiffel Tower, Burj Al Khalifa and so on, right? So, um, the ones that are more widespread are the ones between the 1.2 megawatt and the 2 megawatt because they are a little bit more, uh, you, can, you can put them in a farm, so a farm of wind turbines. And we can see a lot in Morocco, especially like in, in the north, I'm from Tetuan, so in the north on the reef mountains, if you drive between Tetuan and, and uh, Tangier, you can see a lot of them on the mountains. And actually that's wonderful because that's really like a great source of energy there. There's a lot of wind all year long, all year long. So you cannot also put very high tall ones. You need to have ones that are really good for that profile of wind and also that are accessible, accessible in, that, in that area. Um, so, but now let's see how we are turning these uh, these uh, devices or these uh, machines into smart machines. So there was a big push for IoT and um, uh, right, so uh, Internet of Things, uh, and uh, a lot of data is is being collected and created. So let me just give you here quickly, and I'll just uh, be fast on this one. So a lot of data actually is collected on these turbines. So the lot there are a lot of sensors, and it's about twenty five terabyte per day per uh, per. Uh, uh, for the for all of these uh, wind turbines, so much much more than Twitter, for example. 
Uh, but these, these big machines, they don't come without cost. Actually, their cost is very, very high in terms of maintenance and making sure that their performance is accurate. Uh, so there are different types of stages to make sure that these machines, they run smooth. Uh, so first is uh, um, um, making sure you do anomaly detection to make sure that there's no problem, diagnostics, if there is any type of failure. And then prognostics, which is really understanding how long these machines can run and how you operate them and so on. I'll, I'll go through this quickly because there is something very interesting to, to highlight. Dr. Uh, later on. Sorry for interrupting you. Could you please wrap up in five minutes? If yes, possible, yes, that's I am I am actually at the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iman. Uh, so, uh, so there are lots of things. I'll go through this uh, quickly. So, diagnostics. Um, it's uh, you take a lot of data. You look at if there are any uh, problems using a lot of AI and machine learning algorithms. Understand if there are any patterns that could identify that there is a problem with the the, the components or parts of the components in the these machines. By the way, this machine is the reason why it is so important to do this very well, and there is a very good opportunity for this. If one the, the the biggest problem is the gearbox, the gearbox uh, which is the which is inside here, the the this uh, um, this uh, casing here, that's actually the motor for for the for the turbine to uh, translate or transfer the wind energy into electricity and actual energy. If that one is fails. It's called the catastrophic failure. That one is a one and a half million dollar problem, right? Just to replace it because you don't have these gearboxes laying down around. There is six months uh, if you want to get a new one, et cetera. So it's very important to identify failures before they become catastrophic and you have to replace it completely. Uh, prognostics meaning uh, in this case, you look at the, the can we predict uh, whether a, um, a failure could provoke a specific damage. Uh, and can we push that even more? So this is really to understand the reliability of the components and do condition-based uh, maintenance, basically, right? So this will reduce, also you don't wait for, for problems to happen, you do maintenance to prevent problems to happen. So this is, and this is actually my wrapping up uh, slide. So this is, I think for Morocco, this is like really, really good. And we can expand it to more than just wind turbines. I know like in Morocco, the wind turbines are actually external companies that does this for, for them. It would be great if we can have partnerships between universities, uh, industry and uh, the wind uh, renewable energy companies to do actually all these uh, condition-based maintenance uh, using a lot of this data and AI and actually moving from being reactive, meaning uh, we don't know when there is a failure, it occurs, you just have a little bit of time to, to adjust to it, but you're not preventing it, right? And we want to be more predictive and with AI actually, we, and having all this data, we can predict where the failures might occur when they occur and actually uh, uh, try to solve them before they, they happen. And actually the be better would be can we prevent even these failures from happening at all? And actually, there is actually some some interesting work there uh, to prevent and and manipulate or actually manage or operate these turbines differently based on a health index, so that if they have some defect, you don't push them uh, to uh, to the point where there would be a failure, but you might, you operate them in a way that keeps it a, a little bit better. And then uh, this way you extend the life even of the, the life of the components, which is very important in Morocco, right? So how much we can extend, which means we don't have to spend a million and a half or so on the turbine to get it fixed and get replacements and so on. So there's a lot of very interesting uh, work that can be done. So with that, I'll conclude that actually uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, um, opportunities uh, and I, I just mentioned a few, like, for example, robotics, uh, but you can uh, imagine here like wind turbines. I talked about wind turbines, but it could be extended to jet engines. I worked on jet engines as well. It could be extended to other uh, type of, uh, uh, let's say, for example, uh, uh, gas turbines, uh, generators for electricity, uh, big big machines, small machines. So these, these, uh, there's a big 
opportunity wherever there is data that is uh, collected, there is big opportunity for AI to come and solve a lot of problems. Uh, so here really making sure, I think the most important things is really now that you have all these data, make sure that when we collect data, it's not it's collected by some by by a team and then hand gets hand off to scientists to make sense out of it. It needs to be actually a partnership between the engineers and how this data is collected, how the sensors are put, is, are put, what is the rate, the frequency of this data, how it is collected, because otherwise it becomes just garbage and you can't use that data, even though you, you might have a lot of it, but it's not useful. Uh, also make sure that, uh, um, you know, coming up with algorithms, Morocco, we have a lot of uh, really great uh, resources in terms of very good uh, background in mathematics, very solid background in math, uh, and AI, that's actually the gist of it, right? So we have really, really good schools that produce really high quality uh, mathematicians and engineers with really strong background in math. So algorithms, I think, is the natural choice for that. So my dream would be to see uh, actually um, Morocco becoming a big hub for AI. Um, uh, and then the other thing is security. So I talked about one part of the security, which is making sure that customer information doesn't get leaked. Uh, and there are ways of reducing that and using AI as well for that, but also really managing security from the cloud perspective, especially with what if we are pulling all this data from all these machines, pushing some of this information. There is a lot of hacking and problems there. Just I'm, I'm not going to tackle that problem, but I just wanted to highlight that and making sure that we have really good infrastructure uh, to handle all that. So from uh, collecting the data, uh, running uh, the big uh, the deep learning algorithms, and so on. Right. So with that, I'll I am done with my talk and. I'll take any questions if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Bouchard for this insightful and interesting presentation about packages handling and also wind, uh, wind energy. It was very insightful and we learned a lot with so many applications and we hope as well to see Morocco becoming a big hub in AI. So uh, for for sake of time, we have some questions, but I will move to to this question that will uh, provide so much uh, uh, advice to our community. So could you give us some few words to the to Morocco AI community and Morocco in general? As I just mentioned briefly before I finish the presentation, I think uh, Morocco has really great potential for AI. Uh, as I said, the, the bag really the foundation for AI is math, and Morocco is is very well known for actually it's world known for really good math, uh, producing really great students and engineers with really strong math background. Actually, I was one of them. I was told that by several of my professors. Uh, so I think it's um, uh, and 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 really with AI, it's um, you you don't need much, right? You need a lot of like brain power, which Morocco has. Uh, some of the infrastructure, which is accessible, there is a lot of really good uh, partnerships with uh, big companies, uh, like with Amazon, I know, like with Microsoft, for example, Microsoft really uh, uh, has a presence there. I know IBM as well and Google, hopefully we can pull them, but really getting uh, some of these uh, uh, talents from outside uh, and also like some of the infrastructure and really um, put in a, a hub uh, that would be my dream would be putting a hub for Morocco as being the AI center of excellence for uh, data, right? Manipulation and then solving a lot of applications. But specifically for Morocco would be like in renewable energy. I think Morocco can be the leader and showcase in how uh, how uh, sustainability and renewable energy can be pushed uh, uh, and also not only for the, the environment, but also for, um, uh, you know, for making sure that we are at the forefront of this technology and why not being producers of energy to Europe with re renewable energy from Morocco. That's very possible. And with AI, uh, you can tap and reduce the cost, increase the performance, uh, reduce the maintenance, make it more efficient. Then, and you have, uh, we have a lot of uh, resources in Morocco for that. Uh, 
So that's that's uh, my idea. I'm pretty sure there are lots of other good applications we can use AI for, like in healthcare and uh, uh, and actually agriculture. But it's not my area of expertise, so I leave that to others. Um, but I'm pretty sure there's again, whatever there's data, AI could be put to a good use. Thank you very much for those insights and for sharing all this information. So the those interesting slides. So please, there attendees, if you have any question, please reach out to Dr. Bushra Bukhtahir in the platform in Zoom or directly through her email or through LinkedIn. Thank you very much once again, Dr. Bushra Bukhtahir, for accepting our invitation and for sharing all these insights and information. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Really a pleasure.